Hello, everyone. You are listening to Our Future Past, the early music podcast. This series is produced by REMA, the European Early Music Network. I am Yasmina Cernčić, and this episode was curated by the AEC, the European Association of Conservatories, and in particular, by Isaac Alonso de Molina, who teaches Renaissance music theory and performance practice at the Royal Conservatory of The Hague. Isaac chose to focus on the different models of early music teaching, how early music departments and conservatories work with the other departments, what some other more non-traditional paradigms can be, and of course, what difference all of this makes for the teachers and students. Let's first welcome Isaac Alonso de Molina. In Den Haag, I teach in the theory curriculum of the early music department. Since the last few years, we have established a curriculum. Let's say they develop a, a series of skills that we consider necessary for the type of work that we, that we want to do and that were not available to them as long as they were taking the generalistic music theory courses. So this means there is summarization, there is counterpoint, so improvised counterpoint, there is continuo, and all these sort of things that in a way replace the standard solfege, harmony, music theory, uh, and even music history also. How do you define early music in the Hay Conservatory? Then Ha has been historically quite strong in the, uh, let's say, in the Baroque period, mostly in the High Baroque period. There is a lot of uh, tradition of uh, performing the music of Johann Sebastian Bach and the contemporaries. And uh, there was a bit less of all the other stuff. Nowadays, the students have to go through a menu of general music skills that are relevant for medieval, Renaissance and Baroque music. That is what we, in a way, provide even if not all of them are involved in all the repertories. Them learn solmization, for example. All of them practice also French Baroque solfege, uh, even if they want to specialize in something else. This would be kind of a wider approach that uh, also might change a little bit in the future, because it might be that we focus a bit more on the early modern era for the years to come, and uh, in a way situate uh, the early repertories, uh, medieval music, more as a, as a kind of an elective, for example. But uh, till this point, it has been like that. So this course, for example, I was teaching material really from the 11th century till the 18th century. Looking back at when early music first began forming itself as an idea, also in school environments, a big portion of its identity was in being in somewhat of an opposition to classical music. Would you say this is still the case? And if not, what idea do you think represents it better nowadays? It's a very, very interesting question, and of course, this is what we are thinking all the time these days. And uh, it has, it, it, lots of things have happened, have happened in the time. One thing about the, about the ensembles in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of medieval and Renaissance stuff, maybe not so much about 18th century uh, stuff. Then by the 70s, there were all these orchestras, for example, all these, all these ensembles in, in the United Kingdom being created and uh, having a very high professional level, changing completely the, the perception that people have of, of early music. Together with this, the conservatories have been developing, maybe a bit later, a bit 80s and 90s, strong early music departments, so there's even more of that professionalization. I think, I think that we, we need to recover all these ideas from the past, and there needs to be some sort of redefinition, because probably there is a bit of confusion, or there is quite a bit of confusion with the, with the terminology. Early music seems to refer that uh, about the distance in time with the repertory. Then you have also the attitude, as you were saying, which would be maybe more related to the expression of historically informed performance practice. So it is a bit complicated to, to, to see what, what the definition of early music can be. I would go more for the idea that early music needs to restate these basic ideas as a, not necessarily against classical music, but as an intensification of classical music, of the ideas of classical music. Let's say, uh, whether you have early music or not, there is a basic problem that is always there. There's a basic anachronism in the fact that you are performing music of the past. You're performing music of a society that is different to ours, that belongs to a different time and probably a different context, but also if you're doing Brahms, yeah? So the idea that there is no reliable continuous tradition from uh, the performance of all this music, and then there can be a general, let's say, situation of, of uh, yeah, anachronism, maybe, maybe is the word. Then early music is just the awareness of that anachronism and a historical take on that anachronism. So the basic problem will still be there, if, even if there's no early music. Then the necessity is 
probably to restate all these uh, all these ideas to redefine them and stay polemic probably stay polemic and uh, keep the dialectics going because this is probably the main the main service that early music can do from my point of view or from what i try to introduce in the in the school and in the department specifically what i like is to talk always about a shift in the focus so shifting the focus from the repertory and its performance to uh, musical skills and try to develop the musical skills. Uh, the mastery of the instrument is there, of course, but there are a lot of other skills that play a fundamental role in, or played a fundamental role in the music making in the, in the past. And that is actually that skill gap that sets, sets us a little bit apart from, from that music. Yeah? So the repertory is there, the skills in the sense of instrumental mastery and the idea of performance practice has been there already for a, for, for, for a while. But for me, all these ideas still put the repertory in the center. And I think that the skills should be in the center. Just, just for the example that I, was, that I was introducing before, this idea of, of a success history. Yeah? I normally put the example of Basso Continuo. But from the point of view of the revival of Basso Continuo, I think that is one of the most important developments in the last 50 years, the revival of Paso Continuo, the skill of playing from a figured or and figured bass and create music uh, from that. And at this point, I would say that it doesn't really matter how far the modern skill is from the really historical counterpart. Yeah? But at the, very least, uh, at the very least, it is a skill. And then this skill that was probably important from the point of view of performance practice, let's say it was necessary to perform for historically informed reasons, for authenticity reasons, etc. It was necessary for the performance of the, of the repertory. But once it has become a skill, it has had many other effects, because once people have learned to play bass continuo, they, they see music in a different way. And anyone that has uh, developed that skill can tell and can attest to this fact that you see music in a completely different way. It has opened a level of awareness that would not be possible without, without the skill. I can see from my, from my colleagues in the classical department, the, the music theory teachers, that Continuo has had a huge effect in their field, even. So that, that a skill has an effect in a field that is not necessarily just the field of the skill. Uh, the, for them, uh, it's very clear that it has put in question the traditional harmony theory, you know, that from Rameau and the Harmonia Lere tradition of a German theorist and Riemann Schenker and all this stuff. And today, many music teachers use continuo based ideas and uh, partimento, the idea of movimenti, and all these mythos to teach how music works, not, not anymore just for performance. I'm trying to do the same with the idea of historical solfege techniques, solmization specifically, specifically, but also French Baroque solfege, and I'm trying to do this same idea with, with counterpoint. Once we have the skill, probably people will have a different view on the, on the music. How would you say your students define early music? For the students, I think the, there are many of them that have a specific uh, repertory in mind, yeah, because they have a specific instrument and there is like a music that they love and that they really want to do. And I think that has a strong effect in what they define as early music. But all of them are very interested in the idea of historical information. And I would say that what I gather from them uh, is that they are mostly even more ready than we normally think to go for experimentation and to go for ways of performing that we know from sources that were possible or at some point desirable or even undesirable because of difficulties yeah, in talking about practical uh, aspects of music, performing in different setups, in difficult placements also in the, in the idea of performing from the choir lofts and all these sort of things. And most of them, I see that they are very interested in this experimental aspect. Even though the school is sometimes more worried about giving them a strong professionalization yeah, aspect in which they can uh, work immediately. The department was really from the beginning that they started to introduce early instruments. So, for example, the harpsichord and the recorder, etc. Yeah, that's normally the, the, the starting point. I think it is really there from the beginning. When I was a student, there was no specific theory for the early music students. There was only the main subjects and the, also all the electives and a lot of very interesting material. 
But if you needed to do theory, if you needed to do the basic musical skills, you needed to take the generalistic uh, approach, which I think means that in the time it was normally expected that, uh, that you were already a musician when you were getting into early music. These necessities are changing now, so this is a very interesting question and something that has to be uh, developed more. Is it the best idea to start directly with early instruments? Not putting the question from the traditional point of view that many people take that have to do with skills and expertise and instrumental proficiency. I take it more from the point of view of, can you start a critical view on something without having that something first? Understanding early music like internal criticism. For example, also a criticism on the way of talking about music history and the way of talking about repertory and the work of art paradigm and the idea of the composer as a genius and all these sort of things. In a way, it's necessary to have both ideas and start from the point of view of the dialectics already, from the point of view of the polemics. Talking about elementary music education, when do you think it should start and how do you think it should look like? I think that you have to start as early as possible with the, but from the point of view of the skills. For the point of view of historiographical criticism or performative criticism and all these sort of things, maybe you can wait to the moment where, where a person is already in, let's say, like uh, college uh, years. The question is, do not burden the kids with the discussion on how things should be performed and, uh, yeah, and the per uh, yeah, all these historically informed things. Give them the skills because they can really learn them very quick. And this will make a difference in the future when they, let's say, take their performative decisions from a skilled background. How does the more conventional conservatoire paradigm clash with the idea of early music? Around, let's put the date of 1800, the new model of the conservatory becomes established. It has to do with all the changes that happened in society at that time with the fall of the ancient regime. And there is a replacement of the old systems of uh, belief, of the old mythologies, if you, if you want. The mythology of monarchy, the mythology of uh, theology, so the throne, the altar, all these mythologies get replaced by a bit more modern mythologies. And I think the, the one that is central for that is the idea of culture. When these things change, culture becomes a series of things and not a process anymore. And art, art becomes also a series of things, a specific series of things, instead of the skill practice of something. With the, with the change, which is mostly related to the ancient regime, as we were saying, and the bourgeois society, this changes completely. And the conservatory is made in this new situation. This means that music is understood now not just as an art in general, but as one of, of the fine arts. And the fine arts are supposed to be the, let's say, the segregation in art between the useful part and the beautiful part. Yeah? The craft stays with the useful part and the fine arts stay with the beautiful part of the, of the meaning. But they are separated and they are not going to be the same anymore. And they were one and the same thing. This is one thing. Another thing related to that, to that change, is that the aristocratic society can pay for an artist to be part of a household. And this is something that changes everything because then the musician musicalizes an event or the painter is painting the, I don't know, the ceiling of the, of the palace or something like that. After this change is the bourgeois society, which is the, the role of the patron. And that's not possible anymore. So you have to buy a piece of art, a token of art. And this means that art becomes the things. The conservatory is made for this paradigm of classical music, which is connected to the idea of the fine arts. This means the new society after the ancient regime. And there is a tokenization, commodification of works of art. Yeah? Then the role of the musician is to perform the repertory that is already made. This all separates us from, uh, from the skills of the music, from traditional skills of music. And actually, in general, the, the music that we deal with in the early music department does not really fit with all, these, with all these paradigms. And not only that, I would say that in general, this way of looking at music might end in some sort of like alienating process because the work is never yours. Yeah? It is like, it's always the composition of someone else 
there is this thing, and I think that going for the skills will help also for the empowerment or the ownership of the music by the, by the musician. A bit more going for this earlier paradigm, which is closer to the idea of atelier, to the idea of workshop, and not so close to the idea of museum. Yeah, it might be impossible because we are in a completely different society, but it might be that we can import these old contents into the new, into the new model. Some of the skills of those musicians trained in the old world are relevant to us, and these do not have a place in the normal structure of the conservatory. If you think, for example, about the idea of main subject, yeah, this is, a, this is a, of course, a, for all music before 1800, but if you think about uh, medieval music, about the medieval musicians, they played basically everything, yeah, all the instruments and singing, and, and yeah, so this makes no sense for the type of music that we are dealing with, for the materials that we are dealing with. So it is there, which I think is necessary to be conscious of that. Having the double side that having a strong institution gives you a lot of possibilities and at the same time it forces you into some sort of uh, grid that you have to work around in a way. What is your vision for the future of early music education? My vision is to work uh, more specifically for m music of the Renaissance and the Baroque, so 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and uh, developing all these core musical skills with the um, purpose that this will grow, these skills will be part of the equipment of the students in, in the future, and this will have a, let's say, a growing relevance in the musical practice. I think that there is a lot of early music teaching that is still too much like a translation of the classical paradigm. I have come to the, let's say, awareness that there was a lot of music making together between teachers and students. And not so much student plays and teacher listens and then criticizes or whatever, yeah? Because the focus was on the activity itself of making music. The teacher is already a good music maker, so you make music together with the teacher and by that process you're learning the, the skills. And the focus then is not so much on the student, on what you are doing, but the focus becomes the activity itself. And I think that this is something that we can, we can develop. If we can go more into this direction, I can imagine instrumental lessons in which most of the time is playing together, most of the time. It is possible when you go for these historical methods to actually mix different levels, to actually have different levels. And this is something that is not the case in our modern society. We have kids, little kids working with little kids at the level of little kids. We have college level, people in the college levels practicing or studying at the level of the college, etc. Yeah, professional level and so on. But if you think about the musical, the music making, till at least till the 18th century, I'm thinking now about the example of uh, the Matthew's Passion yeah, by Bach. There are parts of that that were supposed to be there just for the choir boys. Yeah? These choral melodies in the first movement, in the last movement. Choral movements in long values, one note at a time. The kids that were doing that were only able to do that in the time. Those who were able to do a bit more took part in the tutti choirs, in the chorales, maybe, those who could do even a bit more, yeah, and so on. So there's something for everyone. Then, this idea of working together has all the social connotations that I think are important to actually redefine the musical practice, yeah? So the musical skills would be understood as cultural heritage, the skills themselves, and not just the repertory. Thank you, Isaac, for explaining what is at stake when we consider an early music department in a bigger conservatory. There is more to it than just a context for teaching and learning. The whole mindset of the students may change and alter their later professional life. But also, it is fair that one can always go beyond this division and consider, as a whole, that in the end, it's all about what is being taught musical skills, and the empowerment of performers so they can look at any score with an informed eye. Our next guest is Claire Michon, who coordinates the early music activities of Paul Aliénor in Poitiers. I'm Claire Michon, I'm a recorder player, and currently I'm teacher but also head of the pedagogical uh, training and head of early music department and head of international relations in the Paul Aliénor in Poitiers, which is one of the higher education institutions in music and dance in France, so in a rather small city. 
This institution welcomes about uh, 100 students in several study fields, classical, early music, traditional, but also jazz and pop. And we have also, an, well, we have bachelor programs in performance and a bachelor program in uh, pedagogy for instrumental and vocal teacher. And can you tell us more about what the words early music mean in your school? How would you define it? Well, in a very concrete sense, it's the department where students who play historical instruments come to study. That's the first, well, that's the, the, the core of, of our early music department, of course. But early music is very important in our school from the very beginning of the accreditation for bachelor programs. And in that sense, we work a lot with other departments. And I would say that early music is embedded in all the programs in a way or in another. All the string students, would say classical or modern string students, have lessons with the Baroque violin teacher, Marie Rouquier, on their modern instruments. It's not a way of just try the Baroque bow and gut strings. No, it's go to the fundamental aspects of historically informed performance, also on modern instruments. I think that the balance between playing together, researching together and high level on instrumental practice might be our early music slogans. But the importance of being creative and acting as responsible musicians in the society, also towards all sorts of audiences. If you are an early music student or a classical music student or a jazz student, does not make any difference. This is a key point of our school, is how to act as an artist in the society together. And therefore you need to be very strong in your choices, in your study, in what makes the core of your, your study, but to be open to other aesthetics, to other students. And that's rather easy in a small institution. Maybe it's easier in a small institution than in a bigger one. Do students generally discover early music for the first time when they come to Paul Adianor, or is there already a pre-college tradition of early music established in France? In the early music department, of course, it's main, mainly the students come and have before have had before uh, historical instruments in their pre-college uh, study. I think almost all of them. But we also have students with double specialty who have had. A modern violin and have pre-college training in modern violin and also in baroque violin because in France early music departments are very active also at the pre-college level. There are many many early music departments in regional conservatoires for example with quite high level in performance on historical instruments. Sometimes students come with both, with the idea of studying both at bachelor level, and we encourage them to do things, but slowly, not to do everything at the same time. So very often they start with one of the specialty first, and they add slowly the other one, or they study for historical performance on the, in the performance department, but they know that as a violin player, for example, you might need pedagogical uh, diploma, so they also train for the modern instrument in the pedagogy uh, department. I have some examples in mind now of students who finished their study this year, and have turned to the early music, to more early music during their study, and now will professionalize more in early music, I mean as performers. Maybe they, they keep the modern path on uh, pedagogy, and that's a good idea, actually, because uh, that leads, that may lead, that might lead to better teachers because they're more open than if they would have had only one path. 
So there is a critical mindset which leads the students to ask themselves exactly where they stand in this variety of aesthetics and approaches. So how would you say your students define early music? Repertoire is something important, but I, I think that they would point on the attitude, on a research attitude and on specific skills in diminution, in uh, improvisation, and not only on repertoire, I'm sure. If you could explain shortly how exactly the situation looks like in France, so what are the options for a young performer wanting to study early music? In early music in France, there are many early music departments in conservatoire music schools, pre-college level. And many early music departments in pre-college regional conservatoire have a quite high level in performance. But in the higher education level, there are, of course, uh, Paris and Lyon, the two conservatoires nationaux supérieurs, well known, of course, with big early music departments. But there are since 2008, I think, uh, new institutions that that we call Pôle Supérieur. So you have the Pôle Aliénor in Poitiers, but you have La Haute École des Arts du Rhin in Strasbourg, or you have Pôle Supérieur Paris-Boulogne. And there are 15 such institutions, and only four have an early music department leading to bachelor degree and only two of them I think uh, have also uh, partnerships with university for a master program. I think there is one in Strasbourg and one in Poitiers where I teach. Those institutions are small if you compare them to other European institutions, higher education institutions in music. But they're very, very active and they are very new and they play a role in France. You know France is a very centralized country. So the aim of those institutions is to spread higher education in music and in arts in general all over the country. So we are young institutions also. Having these recently established 15 institutions is quite a unique situation, adding to that the mix of specializations from pop, jazz and classical to traditional music and early music is sure to feed the pedagogical approach with new practices and critical thinking. How do you think the students choose their school? Do you have a particular slogan or identity as a school which attracts them in particular? It's not a slogan way of, of uh, attracting people, but critical mindset is very, very important. And we try to help them to be critical towards everything, towards the sources, towards their teachers, so towards us, and not just take things are, as granted. If I say, okay, Autotel says that, I want the student to check if it's, if it's right or if if it's just a new tradition coming from my teacher in Holland in the 70s or no, in the 80s, uh, or from myself, I want the student to, to check and to make his or her own mind. That's very, very important. We want them to become very curious in repertoire, in sources, in developing skills, and to balance that with their creativity as artists. To find a way of combining all those aspects in their way of becoming artists. Again, it's a balance between being very diverse and transverse and being very specific. We now leave Claire Michon and thank her for describing this particular situation in France where the newly created bachelor level programs allow early music students to mingle with students of other musical genres, giving them tools and opportunities to specialize with an informed mind in the music they choose. Now let's welcome our next guest, Kelly Landerkin, who comes from a completely different institution. My name is Kelly Landerkin. I am in the management board of the Scola Cantorum Basiliensis. I also teach Gregorian chant and I've been a medieval singer of chant and other repertoires uh, for 25 years before I came into management. So the Scola, maybe that's more interesting than me because it's got a much longer history founded by Paul Zacher in 1933, so already over 80 years. And it was founded as a teaching and research institute for early music. 
And we have both an amateur education part, uh, the music school that was already there at the inception in 1933, and that's remained. But um, what's grown a lot more in the decades since the development of the school um, is the professional department, the conservatory for the oncoming practical musicians. And maybe it's important just to say we offer everything from the bachelor's degree through the um, masters and specialized masters and beyond, everything from medieval through romantic music. What does your institution define as early music? What is your take on the emergence of this movement? Yeah, this is an excellent question. It is true that it felt like um, maybe at its founding, it was quite clear that early music was what was not normally performed, pre-classic. But of course, it's expanded so much since then that we've not only crept backwards in time so that we feel quite capable of approaching medieval repertoires, but also forwards in time. And so um, more than a repertoire or an epoch, I would define it as an approach, a historical way of reflecting upon the music in the context um, that it's being performed in and hopefully um, trying to achieve something close to the idea with which it was originally intended. The early music movement, I would say, developed as a reaction to its current environment. However this current environment was happening, um, whatever was going on, and it was possibly an attempt to strip back preconceived ideas of beauty, of intention as well. And so, I mean, of course, we're, the received idea is that the early music movement is a reaction to romanticism. And also getting back to the roots, trying to find more authenticity, more nature and more honesty. I think we're still looking for honesty. Institutions like the Scola, but also like the Hague and Lyon and uh, Poitiers and, um, are looking through um, close readings of sources, but also organology, to go back and, and to find, for us, new, but possibly old sounds, um, and to listen to them with open ears so that we can offer something new to an audience as well. So we're just trying to keep questioning, keep searching for It's so vague to say searching for authenticity, but we're looking for more information so that we can have a better grounded interpretation. What would you say is it that your students look for when they come to study at the Scola? What is their background? Where do they come from? We seem to, to have two types of students, roughly. Um, the ones who have gone through a classical conservatory training, they've achieved an enviable level of technical virtuosity and personal artistry. And somewhere in that process, they found a performance practice seminar and that spoke to them as maybe a different goal, a different aesthetic. Seeing music maybe in tune with its function and in a communal sense, rather than maybe what I experienced, and this isn't everybody's experience when you do classical conservatory, but I was trimmed to go onto the stage. And that felt perhaps, for me at the time, a bit one-dimensional. And so coming into an early music seminar where that wasn't the goal at all, was absolutely enchanting. So we have students who come at it from this side, and we have others who, because this has been a movement now for 80 years, they have grown up in this. This is now a tradition in and of itself. And some people, we've had, I had a student last year who started with 17 years in the bachelor studies. So no previous classical training. Um, I've had students who started with five on the gamba, and they, they come up through their whole life, and all they've been actually dealing with is early music. This does seem to be something um, maybe deeper, um, not deeper than all musicians, but, but a deep pull in early music for those who are pulled toward it. A search within the sources for yeah, something historical, something, um, a foundation to base your work on.
we generally like to say take this time if you've got two years if you've got three five or seven years because these are the possibilities for lengths of study at the scola take those and really do the deep dive focus on one thing for a little while so that you can really feel confident in how you approach it and then see where it leads you cross-referencing uh, making connections across different repertories and epochs is fantastic and we need that as well but i think you do need to intensely focus upon something for a while in order to be able to wield all of its possibilities in order to use the organization of the tools of the models rather than just to learn how to play that piece of music since the whole school is dedicated to early music the internal organization obviously reflects a more precise division of subject areas than most schools that only have one early music department can you describe how this works The biggest department is the Baroque department. This makes sense um, because this seems to be uh, worldwide the case. But we often find that students who come for the Baroque department drift backwards or drift forwards. So the backwards is fairly easy. We've got we've had a medieval department since the 70s, founded by Thomas Binkley, who was my teacher, <laughs> and um, and so that's been a very strong foundation within the school as well. It's a niche, uh, but it attracts a very interesting student population. Recently, we developed a Renaissance curriculum. So we've thought we don't want people falling between the gaps anymore of the medieval and the Baroque program. So now there's a Renaissance platform as well. But some students then expand toward the classical and the, and the romantic historical approaches, which is quite interesting. But I think that there's a, a large Um, and very uh, dynamic future in the very early repertoires that is just beginning to be explored commercially. The problem is the label. Early music is a bad label, but so is classical music. And the classical conservatories are fighting against the same exact issue. They would prefer not to be called classical institutes or conservatories, but they can't, excuse me for saying, they can't find a better name, just like we can't find a better name, um, at, at least at the moment. Um, I think we're all searching. But yeah, it shows where we came from in both directions. What was the core element, or the core repertory when this institute was founded. Um, and that has defined the approach to music. We're quite fortunate in Basel that, um, that we're able to have a really nice discourse between the Classical Institute and the Jazz Institute and the Early Music Institute. And we find that's been really meaningful on all sides and not just for the musicological approaches of the Early Music Institute. Is the Scola in any way involved in creating forms of elementary early music educational programs? Last year, we had a, um, a symposium called the Modern Music Master at the Scola, and this was uh, reevaluating historical approaches to music pedagogy, um, taking a look back as far as we could in three days in both practical and, and musicological um, source work approaches, workshops, and just seeing where could we go with this? What have we learned and forgotten that we can re-implement? What is better to have been fallen by the wayside? And yes, in fact, our music school um, is doing pilot projects now on getting um, children into ensembles and in getting children into theory classes, not just the instrument, because this has been basically the foundation of the music school was a student has an instrument and may go to a little ensemble, but we're trying to, um, to make this a bit more holistic now. And there was a fantastic project last year with children from Basel, students of the Scola and students from Colombia, from Medellin, who came over and worked on um, a children's pedagogy product with only historical sources and historical approaches. And this was, this was dynamite. Uh, this showed a possible way forward. I know that there's a school in Bern um, in, in Switzerland that's really creative. I'm also really excited about the Italian project in Brescia. 
because they're also looking at this um, early music pedagogy with children. I think that there's a lot going on now and that's an exciting time. What would you say is the main difference between an early music department and an all early music school such as the Scuola? Probably the biggest difference is just size. Um, if we've got a student body of 200 students and we have a faculty of, nine, of 70 teachers who are all teaching historical approaches, then we can realize our own projects. Uh, we don't actually require too much outside help, even though we would like to network uh, with our colleagues as much as possible. But it also helps us to create a multi-dimensional program, a curriculum that isn't just about the historical period instruments and their techniques, but also all of the theory classes are sculpted toward the epochs um, which the students are studying. The medieval students have a medieval theory program and the Baroque students have a Baroque theory program. And of course there's osmosis, you can go between the two, but we're able to offer completely historically dedicated courses in all possible uh, theoretical and practical directions to the students. It does isolate us from the outside world and I think that students may miss this after a while. That could be a downside, but for a certain time um, and for many students this is actually a way to get inside the music as quickly as possible. In this podcast we talk a lot about the future of early music, so as far as education goes, could we speak a little bit about the future generations of early music pedagogues? For a lot of musicians, being a teacher is often more of a necessity rather than a primary career wish. What is your experience with the students studying pedagogy at the Scuola? Yes, um, pedagogy has become more and more important within the school. And I think that that's due to external factors. Um, the Bologna system required a bachelor's and master's degree. They pulled apart the pedagogical elements in the performance diplomas. And you had to get, you had to specify um, you were interested in pedagogy in order to get a teaching diploma then. And if you didn't, you didn't have the qualification. And so now, because everything has become even more professional and you need a master's degree in order to teach at a normal music school, we actually do have um, higher and higher numbers of students who say, for the first or the second master's degree, um, I'd like to pursue a pedagogy program. So it is a monetary, but also from what I can tell, it's also an intrinsic motivation on many students' part to communicate. Uh, communication, whether you're on stage or in a classroom or in one-on-one -on -one teaching, it's all about communicating the music. And the ones who do the pedagogy program want to have the tools that they need in order to learn this. So we've expanded the palette of instruments that we offer. We can't offer all instruments yet, but we have expanded it by, yeah, by several instruments in the past few years and the numbers of students have grown. And also we have given more weight, not just to the practical pedagogical emphasis that they need for regular teaching every day, but also because they're at the Scola, learn historical pedagogy. Take a look at the treatises. What did Garcia say? What did Tosi say? If we're talking about vocal treatises right now. How did they teach voice? How did they teach the instruments throughout time? Um, and does that still work for us today? What does that tell us about how a technique fits to a repertoire um, versus I have a healthy voice and I can sing anything? This is a fundamental question. So to sum up, what would you say your vision is for the future of early music performance? That's very hard to answer, but what I'm optimistic about is that we are still searching and that we are not desperate to find answers, but trying to find new paths. What I think I see that we're getting away from is the fact that the written source of music is the only reference. There's a whole other system of implicit ideas and performance practices Contrapunto alla mente and partimento practice and, and uh, improvisation, things that, um, that enliven a performance and that also enliven the teaching situation. Um, how do you get people to be in the moment? Um, give them something to do that, that works on um, their basic techniques, their basic tools, and that they can keep playing with. So 
part practical, part theoretical, and wouldn't it be lovely if at the pinnacle of this it becomes an amalgam of um, of a fantastic performative composition, improvisation, um, with a great theoretical undergirding. Um, so I would like to see much more in interdisciplinary work. I think it'd make for fantastic and really exciting performance as well. Thank you, Kelly Landerkin. Our next guests are Marcello Mazzetti and Livio Ticli, directors of Palma Corallis in Brescia. The interesting thing about their project is that they are in fact working to create a historically informed pedagogical approach to music teaching based on the ways musicians were studying music in the Renaissance, for example, and then use the same principle to educate anyone, from the youngest and those who learn music more as a hobby, to the more advanced professional performers. And my name is Marcello Mazzetti, and um, here with me there is Livio yeah. Tickley. Hi, <laughs> thank you for inviting us for having and, us uh, here. And we, we are both uh, directors uh, of Palma Corallis Research uh, Group and Dilly Music Ensemble, uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, an, Italian, um, an Italian reality uh, which can combine uh, historical uh, research with the performance. And, um, and from 2015, uh, we started this project, uh, this uh, pedagogical project, within uh, the Diocesan Foundation uh, Santa Cecilia in Brescia. It's a city in the northern Italy. Yeah, we are based here. Although our activity is uh, spread, you know, it's international. So we, we are based uh, and uh, we had the possibility to actually start this uh, particular this uh, educational program uh, at the Diocesan Foundation in Brescia. Yes, yeah, so where, where we are co-founders of this uh, early music department, which is a, a really small reality, actually, but um, with a particular pedagogical path for a different kind of students at any level. We decided we, we want a new institution, we want a new program that can combine really historical evidence of uh, music training uh, from Middle Ages to the Baroque, but also on the other one, we, we want, uh, you know, a more friendly environment approach for the new generations of students. Because uh, the problem is that, uh, like we did, many of us started as researchers. But now you have to put this in a new context, in a school, in a program, so that students can have all the benefits from uh, this being in an in institution, but also with all the bright side of the knowledge on uh, historical evidence. We also decided to start this program because uh, we want uh, an early music that uh, address not only classical musicians, not only grown-up students, but everyone. Everyone means kids from, uh, I don't know, like six years old uh, kids uh, to the elderly with no music background and of course professionals, of course uh, HEI students, uh, that's obvious, but our mission is really to address everyone. Can you tell us more about the curriculum? What do your students learn and practice? Our program can be taught from scratch. So all the subjects that represent the core of our program is, uh, is really talking about uh, basic skills. Basic skills for a Renaissance, for example, medieval musicians or Baroque musicians. With this in mind, we decided, you know, to, to choose some of these, uh, this variety of skills these musicians uh, need to master. We avoided to use the classical way to approach music, so we didn't offer, I mean, just a course in lute or in gamba and let students choose, 
I mean, eligible matters. We started thinking about how in the Renaissance and Bar they could learn music. We realized that the core of those skills were really uh, four or five. That was a, a solmization uh, through the Gidonian hand, which is a, a, an amazing and really successful approach to music because uh, it was used across uh, 1,000 years, from the Middle Ages in Italy to the 19th century. We mean for solmization not just a theory, way to look at the solmization, but a, a singing-based solmization. So it's basically is ensemble singing. And other exactly. skills, uh, other skills is, uh, for instance, the cantus planus, because uh, cantus planus was the base for all musicians uh, across century to approach uh, also the polyphony. Also the, the first step, the first for, step for the pueri, because it was uh, in in many cases it was uh, you know the first lesson of music. It's really easier to to get acquainted with. Uh, 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 reading and singing, so intervals, for example. Yes, and the other skills we are really proud of is the contrapunto la mente, is the improvisation. Uh, we start from actually from the plain chant because all our students are put in the same room and all they sing one cantus firmus, one plain chant, and uh, one after one they are trying to to use formulas which they borrow from uh, the reality and from this approach, really master pupil, and they use to practice uh, into these formulas uh, over the plain chant and um, this contrapunto la mente is a way to connect uh, plain chant to the to the polyphony And the last one is reading, which is read a text in Latin, understanding uh, this text, yeah. and uh, reading from liturgical book. Because the core of our study is reading from primary sources and a, a direct approach to primary sources. So, so our students, from kids to elderly, use just primary sources all the time for practicing and also for performing. Are you adapting your teaching based on the period the students are working on? That's a great question because uh, we know that historically there is uh, a transformation of the music pedagogy and uh, saying that our pedagogy is the same through different century would be just uh, wrong. An oversimplification. Exactly, yeah. it's an oversimplification. But uh, I think it's a middle point to rethink the pedagogy of early music from uh, some common places which we can find uh, also in the Middle Ages, also in the Renaissance, and also in the Baroque music. We know that today there are a lot of uh, approach to music improvisation. Some schools, some teachers uh, use the dance, uh, use the theater, use different skills from uh, other fields uh, of research uh, just for make students uh, more acquainted with the improvisation. Uh, the highest difficult uh, for students uh, to, uh, to put into practice improvisation is uh, they are all scared to make mistakes, but mistakes is really connaturated with the improvisation. As treatises in the Renaissance, the Baroque says that wrong is really a part of the performance. We are used to listen to early music uh, through CDs, uh, through just performance uh, in the context of the concert, uh, which I think fails the point uh, to get uh, a really historic approach to the music, because uh, we are really used to, to listen to the perfection of the music, but the perfection is not what we are think it is, but the perfection is really managed all these kind of skills uh, which are really uh, contrapunto la mente, improvisation all the time, making diminution, ornaments, uh, or uh, improvised a, a new line of polyphony. So it's really more a fluid concept of uh, perfection. What would you say is it that students find with you that they can't find somewhere else? You have a plenty of choice to get uh, familiar with this. Uh, but as we are actually skills. not uh, not a high education institution, we are really free to combine uh, disciplines uh, and also go through different uh, programs. Uh, and so students are uh, more free to choose uh, how many years uh, they want to stay with us.
it's really important for us to interlace with professionals and also for students which are already enrolled, for instance, in conservatoires. So what professionals and the students from conservatoires are looking for in our institution is this kind of approach, historical approach. And finally, what is your vision for the future? It's a sort of dream. When you started a new way to think a complex concept like early music, to see different institution, to see different ensemble, reappropriate of context of the early music. We think that returning to primary sources and the thinking of the set of skills required by music, I mean, in a concept more like a a sort of artisan, a sort of craftsmanship. We will be able, in order to put this uh, fresh approach to early music, to see the next generation of musicians easily range from uh, different instruments, for instance, from different uh, repertoires, but they have the same background. It's like you you are not learning a dead language, like, I don't know... Latin or uh, ancient Greek or something like that, but it's something that is alive. When you are you are able to speak fluently like a native this language, then you can say, okay, I'm dealing with something that is still now alive. I think this is the bridge we want to build between the, you know the past and the, the present and the future also. Many thanks to both of you for sharing your innovative vision on how to train performers of early music by implementing pedagogical practices from the periods in discussion. The last guest in today's episode is here to talk about the international course on medieval music performance of Besalu as yet an alternative model for learning and practicing early music, this time by focusing on a very specialized topic for a very short period of time. My name is Mauricio Molina, director and faculty of the International Course on Medieval Music Performance of Besalú. I'm also a professor of medieval art at the Institute of American Universities. I created Besalú nine years ago with the purpose of basically having that program that I did not have when I became interested in medieval music. And here we are nine years later with a something very concise and, and powerful in terms of education. How is the summer school similar to a regular university program? The summer school is basically like a little, little university program that we run during the summer. It is composed of like specific sessions and lectures that we offer in conjunction with some elective classes that help placing the student in the context of medieval music, medieval society, let's say medieval mentalities, which is an important idea within the course. And... All that is surrounding the one-on-one lessons for instruments, the ensembles, and the performance, because obviously the whole idea is that we create this pie and apply it to the reconstruction of performance practice. Can you tell us more about the pedagogical approach that you put in place in Besalú? Is that something one would normally see in a conservatory? The usual way of teaching in the conservatories is lecturing right, in which a professor presents an information and the student basically absorbs that information and replicates, right? More than to construct his or her own ideas, is a replication of an idea. But the point that our students make is that they feel that we provide them with all these elements of knowledge so they can make decisions on their own. How do you define your role as a fixed-term course with short time means? Did that enable you to develop a specific direction, a vision? Vision is very important when you have a school. Have a vision and focus on what really matters in terms of the goals of the educational program, right? Which at the end of the day is the student, is giving student possibilities. I wanted to create a program that I did not have. So I do know what is important at the end of the day is to be able to create critical thinking. What are the major differences that you can see between an American educational system for early music and a European one? In the American education, the student is very, very important. And the relation, the dialogue with the student is crucial. Students are taken basically by the hand through a path of knowledge. And there's a lot of discussion. There's debate, which is welcome in class. There is the professor should provide the students with a way of communicating the matter, for example. So it's building rhetoric 
within the class as well. So there's a lot of participation, the back and forth between uh, students and teachers, as I said before, in juxtaposition to a more lecture-like, in which you don't participate, you just listen. So let's say that is, those are the precepts of the American way of teaching. But to add to that in Besalú, there's something else, which is the passion, right? There is that passion for teaching. Fortunately, the faculty that I have in Besalú that are all very, very passionate for teaching and for medieval, not only music, medieval stuff. So a lot of people come to study medieval music with us thinking, um, I'm going to study music, right? What they discover all of a sudden when they are immersed in the classes in Besalú is that they are learning art, they are learning architecture, obviously, within art, they are learning languages, they are learning conventions about how people um, organize their lives, for example, about ritual, about religion. It's this very, very rich dish with knowledge that we provide and we explain that is really important in order to reconstruct this music. So my idea has been always be able to communicate the Middle Ages to people at all different levels with all the richness that we can, including um, all different fields. Do you see any evolution for the summer course model? What are, for example, your plans for the future with Medieval Music Besalú? So the whole idea is that, yes, we will move forward with Besalú. Besalú is a pivot point right now before we get into a university program. Crossing fingers, we uh, I'm already um, talking to a couple of universities who are interested. We will have soon a undergrad or a master program on medieval music performance. Thank you, Mauricio. And that's it for today's episode. You have heard what different educational environments early music students can choose from nowadays, from a more general approach to a more specialized, from a formal top-down teaching to the studio situations where you learn with your peers, but also from your peers. I hope you have heard some interesting points in this episode, as I surely did, and will now think more about the deep connections between the multiple pedagogical choices and the vision for music that a student is yet to develop. This is the Early Music Podcast, and the music you have been hearing along this episode is a performance by the students of the Hague Royal Conservatory led by Isaac Alonso de Molina. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Bozar in November 2020 in partnership with the Association Européenne des Conservatoires. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. The next episodes will give you an overview of the topics that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more insight into the lives and ideas of your favorite performers, to know what your favorite concert halls are up to these days, and get to know in advance what you can expect for the next years of live or recorded music and exciting research projects. See you next week for more episodes. <laughs>